Um, I um, just want to take a minute to introduce Denise Cooper. I've actually known Denise for quite a while while I was at the Open Source Initiative. She's a former OSI board director. However, her involvement with free and open source software uh, goes back to the beginning. Um, she is not only an advocate, but one of the leaders and visionaries of the open source software movement. Um, she has had multiple roles, uh, significant roles in both the development and adoption of open source, including a CTO at Wikipedia, chief open source evangelist at Sun, um, senior director of open source strategy at Intel, um, on the project side, she's been a board member with the Drupal Association, as I said, with the Open Source Initiative. I think she might have actually been one of the founders of the Open Hardware Foundation. And today she's most active with uh, the InnerSource, uh, is it foundation or association? I'm not sure. Um, she'll tell us. Commons Foundation. Oh, InnerSource Commons Foundation. And um, she's involved currently with the. Uh, um, uh, Ospos. Oh, I left out PayPal. I'm sure I've left out way too much. She was a head of open source at PayPal. Um, she's uh, one of the most knowledgeable knowledgeable people I know around open source and inner source. She's one of the co-founders of the inner source movement. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Denise Cooper here today. Denise, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, All right, let's get going. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the value of open source as it relates to OSPOs. And um, I know that all of this stuff is new to most academic audiences. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about why I think I have standing to talk to y'all. And it's not that, that list of stuff that Patrick just said. Um, that the good news is we're starting to see really good outcomes for universities that embrace open source in, in specific ways. So we're going to try to talk you into making an OSPO and uh, then maybe doing the right things with it. All right, so here we go. Um, first of all, I want to talk about what is open source. You probably heard this before today, but I'll just do a really quick version. Um, first of all, it, open source is massively parallel peer-reviewed collaborative development. That's what it is. It's a method of doing development over asynchronous teams around the world that we kind of fell into when we got interested in making it possible for people to have open source software. Um, it's only really open source if the code is both published openly and on, under an OSI approved license. And Patrick's right, I did work on the OSI for 10 years. And um, in, you know we work very hard to be sure that the licenses that we approved were um, worked with the open source definition, which is uh, the 10 clauses that define what an open source license is. But actually open source is a lot more than that license and that open code. And just publishing code under one of those licenses is not open source. It is technically open source, but you get none of the benefits from just throwing code over the wall of your firewall and, and you know leaving it there pasted with an open source license. Um, some people think it's a religious cult. Uh, some people think that it's just a silly word. I was accused of being a communist quite often at the beginning in 1999 in Tucson. Um, some people actually believe that open source is a nefarious plot mastermind of Bill Gates and Tim O'Reilly, <laughs> of which I'm an unwitting puppet, but we like that. So um, moving along, how is it different to traditional development models? Well, the main thing is the hierarchy of responsibility is actually navigated through meritocracy, meaning the people who are doing the work, even people who have done work and had reputation, if they stop working in the area, and that's true for institutions as well. It's a what have you done for me lately kind of a thing. Um, in general, security issues are handled more gracefully by proprietary software. Um, they're patched in a matter of hours generally, as opposed to months in some cases for proprietary software. So uh, there are a lot of security experts, including the, one of the co-inventors of um, RSA or uh, Diffie-Hellman encryption uh, with Diffie says that it's definitely uh, palpably bad from a security perspective. Um, although there's no statistical data that shows that, we can show that things that the patches come through much faster. 
Um, all the engineering decisions are made under, and discussed in public in media that is archivable and therefore recallable if you have to understand why a decision was taken. And there is a, a, apparently no vendor lock-in. Now, we'll talk a bit about what vendor lock-in is and how you get locked in. Um, the reason you're seeing this picture here is I, I started Intersource Commons um, almost eight years ago now to talk about how open development is better for engineers for engineers as creators, as makers. Open source feels like a better way to live. And we feel like all the people that are stuck in traditional software development are in the salt mines. And so that's why we get this picture. Okay, why on earth would you do an OSPO? Um, hopefully not a belly flow. Um, OSPO stands for Open Source Program Office, which, um, you know, it's kind of, I, I actually started the first OSPO when I was at Sun Microsystems in 1999. And we called it that because Sun had a naming convention, convention about program offices. And I was going to address open source. So that's why mine was called the open source program office. But within a year, almost every major tech company. Went. So I guess we were doing the right thing. Um, and OSPO feels an intention to work in an open source way. And there are companies and institutions that spin up an OSPO, but then don't actually do the work. Um, and that is also apparent because the work is all public, right? So, um, but doing an OSPO creates a focal point. It means it's somebody's job to get this project over the, to report back up the chain, how it's going, um, to, you know, seek out people within the organization that want to do open source and help them get started in the best possible way. <clears throat> so an OSPO is a focusing organization. Um, it also provides a single point of inquiry. So when people have questions about your open source program and some high profile institutions definitely get these questions, um, you don't want them going to the provost's office or some dean who probably doesn't deeply understand it even if they've been briefed on it. You want them to reach out to somebody who's a good spokesperson for it that person should be reachable through the OSPO. The OSPO's address should be public. Um, it is a huge red flag in tech companies if the OSPO is started in an area other than the engineering organization. However, um, I helped found one of the first OSPOs in American academia at Johns Hopkins University, and it's in the library because at that university, culturally, the library is the most um, common ground space. Everybody uses it, nobody is upset about it. <laughs> the turf war going on, it's got its own budget. It's a fine place for an open source program office to live. And you know, your mileage may vary as you figure out what you wanna do. Um, okay, so one of the patterns that emerged early in the open source world, even after we founded OSPOs, was open source at the edge of the organization. That means not every engineer got to work in the open source way. It was only a few people that were at the edge and they were um, probably treated differently than all the other employees. They had different rights. They had different responsibilities. Um, and as a result, they were either not teaching the organization what to do because they were sequestered or there was a discounting of what they were doing in the outside world because it wasn't the whole company. It was just a little portion of the company, um, usually a disruptive move. Um, now, there are some OSPOs that have done a good job of overcoming this issue, but I'm just telling you, if you're thinking about a sort of um, keyhole or pinhole implementation of open source. Um, we've seen this, we know how it works, we know what doesn't work. Not much will change internally in your organization if you go that way. Um, and it's considered a less disruptive, safer path by companies, but they're not getting the real value of open source when they do it. And we're hoping that academia won't get stuck quite in the same way. So um, open source is a primary method, and this is the open source kid, <laughs> um, is, a, is, is a much bigger change. It's a bigger ask. You need more change agency to pull it off. 
Um, it's kind of like doing a digital transformation, like going to transformation, you know that agile methods can really eat your lunch, but they also have some big upsides. Um, I'm a big fan of agile. I would never tell anybody not to do it. Um, open source, adopting open source as for every engineer that works in your is or your organization is a little bit more like that. Um, as a business method, it's successful as a disruptive method. Um, I was involved in something called open office, which some of you who've been around a while may remember. It was a zero cost to use alternative to Microsoft Office that had all the same features and more importantly, could write back and forth to the same file format. That was a piece of software that Sun Microsystems was getting ready to throw away. They were gonna take a loss on the acquisition of that underlying software because the, the project they acquired it for, they decided not to do. But they were in the middle of suing Microsoft for anti-competitive practices. And because I had worked at Microsoft, I knew that 40% of their income came from office. And if we could hurt them where they lived, that we would we would get a quicker and better settlement. And that worked out. Um, in the end, Sun got $2.4 billion in settlement for um, which they shared with some of the other members of that lawsuit. But open office continued to be useful for people for many years, 600 million downloads every time we changed it until the point that it bifurcated into LibreOffice and Apache OpenOffice. And if you were wondering, LibreOffice is the one to use now, unfortunately. Um, anyway, you can use open source as a primary method in that way. Um, we have started this thing called Intersource Commons, uh, which you can find at um, uh, intersourcecommons.org. And you'll find a nice website there with a ton of information about how to learn open source from inside your firewall, and that will make you a better open source citizen out in the world as soon as you can get there. We'll talk some more about that in a minute, but that's one of the main tools these days for organizations trying to figure out how to get to open source as a primary method. Okay, now we're going to dive into the many functions of an OSPO, the things an OSPO should do for you. So first of all, um, it's a resource for questions. You're going to get questions from people in the CS department, people in the MIS department, researchers, senior management, middle management, um, the press. If you're if you're a publicly traded company, definitely the shareholders. Um, if you're a municipality, citizens. If you're in, in academia, then your students. You're going to get questions from all over the world, and you're going to need to be able to answer them. Once again, having a single inquiry is really a good idea. Um, it might also be worth setting up an ombuds committee, given our current state of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, which I'm fully in support of. Um, having an ombuds office or, or desk means that um, complaints of that nature that are touching the open source program would come to you first, which is a good thing to have. Um, okay. Training and mentorship, another very important part of the OSPO's role. Um, there's a ton of training about open source um, available, not only from Intersource Commons, but also from the To Do Group and from um, OSPO Plus Plus. These are other groups that you may have already heard a little bit this morning. I'll tell you more about them in a minute. Um, um, open source requires leadership, and first organization to figure that out was Apache, Apache Software Foundation, whose main product, the, the Apache Web Server, is still moving the majority of web traffic in the world years, 25 years after they started. Um, they realized that mentorship was important. Later, Google picked up that thread when they were in Summer of Code. And those of you that work in CS departments probably already know what that is. Um, we have been working, uh, the group of people have been working on an update of code called Masters of Code that runs during the academic year so that CS students are working in a curriculum around open source to start happening. This collaborative development environment or massively peer reviewed collaborative development methodology is not easy to learn if you spent your whole life being singled out for your individual excellence. And um, it's really a problem inside the, the open source movement that there are people that know collaborative. So one of the things, Hoping that 
university will do is start up a curriculum around how to work collaboratively. Uh, if is the semesters of code program, which is very slowly rolling out because there's a constraint in the the prime instructor, but it's happened at, J, uh, at Johns Hopkins. It's happening at CMU this year. Um, it's also happening in Ireland this year uh, because we've agreed to take it on as a secondary. Um, so we're not causing that instructor to, to do it himself. Um, this The idea here is that you look at your portfolio of, of software that's been written by your researchers and you find good things that are generally applicable or interesting and maybe haven't been done in the public space yet. And you open source code and run those communities using your own students, but also past students if they're still interested in the, in the um, future students, you get high school students sometimes, uh, rank and file open source people, people from the industry that it touches. We've seen good examples of this happening in places like uh, metal, medical instrumentation. There's an open API for that that has been following its create to, through different schools. Um, there, there are a lot of good examples of this working really well. And it has the added advantage of not taking the big projects productivity down every time there's a new semester starting and a bunch of new students that need to get an A. So um, anyway, training and mentorship, big part of the project. Um, Denise, increasing the internal. Denise, yes. Can I? Can we get you to drop your video just because the audio is breaking up and we might little bandwidth savings there. Oh, OK. Do you have the video? Can you run it? No, no, just your video screen in the lower uh, bottom. Keep your presentation going. And the lower part of the screen, you'll see a oh, little. Oh, I see. You want me to kill my own camera. That's fine. Yes, I'm happy please. to do that. Just, just a second. I have to get to it. It's not. Thank you very easy, much. Tell you the truth. OK, here we go. There you go. Perfect. Thank Better? you. Yes. And then okay. you can switch back and to the I'm presentation going. mode. I'm going back. I love this picture, by the way. This is apparently how they actually do this in Japan <laughs> when they launch a new boat. It's kind of amazing. And notice that the cars are all stopped appropriately and everything. It's pretty great. OK, so greasing the skids. All organizations in the world have multiple ways of getting things done. There's the hierarchical way, and then there's the people who know how to work the system to get stuff to happen faster or better or with um, it can really be a good thing for your open source world to have those kinds of people in your OSPO, at least a sponsor that's that way. Um, analysis paralysis is real. People get scared and they, they want to they strive for perfection. I always say perfection is the enemy of completion. <laughs> you got to do what you can while you can. Now is when academic OSPOs are, are of interest. And there is such a thing as a first mover advantage. So, you know, schools that do this earlier rather than later will do better. But that means that you have to stay out of analysis paralysis. And that's why it's worth having somebody who knows how to push things through. Um, most change requires courage. And leadership in an OSPO um, should be capable of courageous action. And I say that as somebody who's been taking my own career into my hands the whole time. Okay, messaging in and out. Um, OSPOs are responsible for saying to the company or the organization, this is what we're doing, this is why it's good. Yay us um, for making individuals rock stars when they do an amazing job. And if you haven't already heard it, there's a fabulous story that the University of Santa Cruz, uh, University of California at Santa Cruz people tell about their OSPO, which is actually a profit center for their university and a pretty major profit center. And it's all hinges around a single grad student who was already wealthy, but then came back, got a PhD and took his, uh, the work that he'd done with their blessing back out and started a company with it that then did really well. And they came back to him and said, hey, you're our famous alumni. Would you like to give us some money? And he said, yes, I would be happy to, but only if you use it to create a program that enables other students to do what I just did. And that's what they've done. And it's good for the university and good for the tech world and good for the individual grad students. It's definitely attracting grad students to their CS department. So that's happening because they're messaging both out to the world and into the organization. And you want them to be good at this. That means you want somebody on the OSPO staff that is good at internal communication 
and you want a very good relationship with the PR organization in your in in your world. Um, let's see. Uh, modeling how to keep how to reference. Um, when I was at PayPal, we actually taught over a thousand new hire, new hires, new college grads, and interns how to speak effectively. And we were doing that because we were making the point that it's not enough to hire great engineers. You also have to empower them to represent you well. And nobody teaches that to engineers. It's not something that they learn. Well, we taught it using a tool called um, Ignite Speaking. Uh, we held Ignite events on campus. We encouraged people to come to a three hour class. Sounds like a lot, but we taught them how to make a presentation that was compelling in no time and then deliver it. This is really good. And this was a project of the OSPO. Um, we also had a little 15 minute segment that we could slot into every new hire orientation. So, you know, in a new hire orientation, you get all the people that got hired including the admins and the janitor and also the engineers and, you know, some VPs. It's a, it's a real mix. It's an opportunity to um, set a precedent on what it is that you're trying to do. And um, so we highly recommend that as a messaging program for us. Okay, developing strategies. I told you guys about open office. I'm the one that saw that opportunity and convinced the CEO to do it. And it made me famous in open source. There are other set strategies. They sometimes require taking legal risks or being willing to take a legal risk. Um, they sometimes require getting a company, um, sorry, tricking your organization into doing open source. That's what we did with Intersource. We were trying to teach PayPal how to do open source. We needed to tutor them from the inside, but we also wanted them to practice open source while they were being tutored because they were afraid and they were stuck in analysis paralysis. So we made this public organization that's a nonprofit, Winter Source Common, and we started sharing everything we were doing there. Um, soon, Paul got, this, got in the swing of it. They started sharing too. This is, this is a really useful tool. So developing strategies that disrupt the status quo, I think should be part of the job of the OSPO. Watering the commons. Um, you guys are academics, so you know about the tragedy of the commons, which is that if uh, common grasslands are overgrazed, they soon are no longer grasslands. And you, if you don't keep watering that grass and let the sheep overgraze, then you're destroying a common good, not your own land. Um, open source is very much this way as well. And you have to water that commons. That means you have to give um, you have to give cycles to it. You have to you have to legitimize it. You have to give it uh, engineering where it's needed, especially in collaborative projects across organizations. Go ahead and let your students work on that. Let your researchers work on that. Don't try to capture every penny of value that's created in your organization through patents and those schemes, because honestly, they don't work very well. And I know a bunch of y'all just signed a big pact to double down on patents, but it's a bad idea. Um, Trinity in Dublin has had an open source program office in their tech transfer office for a decade now. They don't, they don't handle every single tech transfer piece of work, but they do a pretty high percentage of them. And there's a, you know, consideration every time one comes available, whether or not open source would work. So there's lots of ways to water the commons. Um, summer of code, semesters of code. Uh, the company Indeed, which is an employment company, started something a few years ago called the FOSS Contributor Fund. That's where you figure out which pieces of software you're dependent on in your organization. So for San Francisco State University, it's Drupal. They're dependent on Drupal. And their curriculum in both CS and MIS, written by a brilliant um, professor named Samir Verma, is, is set up to allow... Um, the students to work in Drupal, even the MIS students have to stand up a, 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 sorry, a Drupal server and communicate through it because Samir's take on it is this is new productivity tool, being able to use the web in this way. And this is open source. You might as well learn how to do it. So there's lots of ways to get creative about your watering of the commons. Um, and then building healthy communities. This is the real job of an OSPO, the most important job. But it takes a while to get this lift, you know, a whole sea of people. This is, I think, well, I'm not quite sure where this is. Um, 
but getting a whole sea of people to you know hold this project aloft is going to take some a while um, you have to start by leveling the playing field that means stuff that you open source has to be addressable by anybody from any organization anywhere in the world you can't put up any any gates on that and more importantly the experts that wrote it your researchers and and people that worked on it internally can't be the only possessors of knowledge open source is about spreading the knowledge <laughs> and um when patrick was listing my my cv he meant he, he forgot to mention i was also the cto of wikipedia for a while so i'm a big fan of open knowledge um so building healthy community requires you to erase the hierarchy that naturally exists between you in your mind and everybody else um, it's consistently surprising to people once they do this how smart the outside world is not all of them but enough of them that it's worth doing bill joy said genius is uh exists everywhere it's evenly distributed we just haven't discovered it all yet and this is one way to discover it um let's see it's hard though for for teams that have spent a lifetime doing this work internally it's really really hard to do this thing of setting up a healthy community and that's why you need organizations like the ospo plus plus and to do group this is two different organizations kind of working at the same issues from two different areas so um to do was founded in the in 2011 at twitter and um in facebook and google i think were the three and what they wanted to do was was write out everything they knew about running open source from inside a tech organization and they've done a lot of that work there's a lot of really good content available on the to do groups website um, some academic institutions have a hard time joining to do i know stephen jacobs who spoke earlier is a member of to do um, it has to do with the way that the uh, their affiliate agreement is worded but um, they do have good publicly available information and they also host some conferences around OSPOs. Um, OSPO Plus Plus was more recently founded, um, not too long before the pandemic, actually just a year and a half, I think, before, uh, by some concerned citizens that wanted to see if, if open source could help their local municipality. And they wanted to do it through their local university. And this is Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Um, there's a lot of free content available at OSPO Plus Plus, and I would invite you to spend time there because OSPO Plus Plus was set up with that dual focus of academia and municipal governments. And in the work that we've done over the last five years, I can tell you that we firmly know that you must be um, thinking differently about your OSPO to what the tech companies have done. I mean, it's useful. That's why I'm telling you about it. But you need to think differently. That's like the semesters of code idea was a think differently idea because the needs are different. And we'll talk about those in a second. Um, anyway, go check out these two organizations for sure if you're thinking about doing an OSPO. Um, talking about academic needs and, the, you know, I'm telling you your own business here and I apologize. By the way, this is the beautiful uh, Trinity Library in Dublin. Um, so uh, the patents, patents, tech transfer, tech translation, all of that stuff is sort of firmly in the, in the sights of open source because we believe that it's a better way to actually get the technology out there. It doesn't have the same monetary tag, but there's been a lot of studies that show that those, those um, you know, charge for, the, for access to the ideas uh, efforts are not always all that lucrative. And the reputation that you gain, or if you're able to do what um, Santa Cruz did and actually get, you know, investment in your factory of, uh, of future ideas, uh, can be much more lucrative than than you know licensing fees. So anyway, that that issue has to be worked on uh, by every university that decides to do this. Um, as we said, you'll generally have programming resources because you have all those students, but they're only there for a short period of time. So Figuring out how to hand off information or, or save the information that is learned uh, in a way that is gleanable later is going to be important. And open source has lots of good, good ways to do that. If you go look at Apache or InnerSource, which is based on the Apache way, you'll see lots of advice about how to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, I talked already about teaching curriculum for CS and MIS. 
technically you can use um, this to do anything. You know, we've written documents using it. We've written licenses using it. It doesn't have to only be in those two disciplines. It's just that they're more likely to encounter it in their day-to-day -day work life after they leave you. Um, there are existing course materials to start with. That guy I talked about, Samir Verma, has put up all of his course materials, syllabuses, um, uh, lesson plans, you know, everything. So you can definitely start there uh, under a uh, Creative Commons license, which is an open source license for content. Um, okay, and then Semesters of Code is actually a great thing to look at. I mentioned it before, so I won't go into it again now. And then municipal government needs are actually different. This is the Hotel de Ville in Paris at Christmas time. It's not usually blue. Um, most municipalities don't have adequate engineering resources at their disposal. They might have a small team, but they tend to hire from body shops like Deloitte and Accenture. Um, and that has proven to not be good for their open source efforts. Um, so Paris actually wrote an amazing piece of software over 10 years ago called Lutece, uh, to the old name for Paris. And it is a comprehensive messaging system for governing citizens. And, you know, Paris is a world-class city and they're very good at this thing of governing citizens. Um, so much so that the administration keeps getting voted back in. They do something called participatory budgeting and they do it through this tool. It is completely open source, 217 separate services and a common server that runs them all written in Java. And um, we helped uh, bring that to the States through Johns Hopkins University for the use of certain entities in Baltimore. Um, the neighborhood uh, community centers are actually kind of keeping that city together right now. And we gave them a scheduling platform and a bunch of other stuff using bits and pieces of Lutes. Um, they're delighted because they've been trying to build a community forever, but they didn't know how because municipalities weren't really engaging in this behavior. So um, because of the non-technical nature of staff working for municipalities, they often fall prey to sales tactics from disreputable or maybe reputable but not ethical companies selling to governments. And they almost always overbuy or are talked into buying more than they need. And then they discover that they're locked in and they don't really understand how to get out of that problem. And this is happening all over the world. What we would like to see is a bunch of municipalities getting together to create an alternative universe. You know, it was very far fetched when we said we wanted an alternative universe to the traditional development methodologies being used before 1999. But it worked out. It's changed the whole industry. And it can change municipal government as well. We firmly believe that. And that's why OSPO++ is addressing those two communities. OK, this is my last thing. Um, I have to say something about all boats rising. Every time I give one of these talks to a new group that are thinking about open source for the first time, I hear self-protection and you know versions of what in the in, you know, I, on a country level would be called nationalism. We're going to help ourselves. We don't really care about everybody else. That's not how open source works. Open source is by its very nature, something that works across all the boats. You know, if you think of us as these boats sitting on the beach, not able to swim because we don't have or float because we don't have water. When the water comes in, which is what open source is, all the boats rise. And any program that tries to keep your neighbor or your competitor university or your you know, municipality that you're afraid of from also potentially benefiting from this work is diluted. It's not possible. And it's taken China two 10-year plans to get to a point where they understand now that they can't do that um, effectively. They tried to have their own open source universe separate from everybody else. And it hasn't worked out. And if they couldn't pull it off, certainly an individual university is not going to do a good job of it. So sharing is very important. And not just, again, throwing code over the wall and running away, seeing what happens. And also not just throwing information over the wall and seeing what happens. You have to show up to engage. And this is one of the most important things about the OSPO is explaining this over and over and over again. But it's always to the benefit of both the organization and all the people around it, all the environs around it when you get it right. So it's worth doing. Okay, thank you. That's me. I've said all I'm going to say. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Denise. Um, we technically the next session starts in five minutes, but there's no one in this conference room, if you will. So if we have some questions from people who might want to be a little late, don't tell Jen I said that or Kathy. Um, uh, if you have a couple questions, maybe um, uh, we can answer them here. I'll let you uh, moderate those for me, if you will. Yeah, I'm looking in the chat. Um, uh, is there an annual IT conference in CUNY, the City University of New York, during the first week of December for 15 plus years? Your session is worthy to be a panel keynote presentation there. It's so refreshing. Um, ah, thank you. I, I don't know thank if that's an, an invitation. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I will say uh, that for, for many years when I was funded by Deep Tech, um, if you ever asked me to go speak at a conference in an unusual country that was you know, going to be a lot of travel like Vietnam or, or China, I'd say, yes, I will come, but only if you find me a university to talk to as well. And I want to talk to students. Um, well, so, yeah. so um, I will ask the CIO to suggest it to the higher ups. Okay, so um, I don't know if you need contact information. I think Denise. Well, my my Twitter handle's right there on my screen yeah. right now, so that's how to get a hold of me. Okay. Um, other questions. Um, the other. Um, where would where do you start? So I guess it's sort of um, this community is. Uh, everything from uh, faculty who are using open source tools and open models for content to technologists who are running open source tools. But um, what's the advocacy path or the path of advocacy to increase? And Well, introduce? I'll tell you how we did it at Johns Hopkins. Um, we found a willing, um, he wasn't a dean yet. He actually was made a dean later. But we found a willing guy who was, had been running the research library for a long time. Um, the person that was working on that is the founder of OSPO++, Jacob Green, and he's an alumni of Johns Hopkins, and he also lives in Baltimore. And again, he wanted to help his, his municipality through open source, and he thought the best way to get there was to go through the university, because it's one of the most richly um, funded research institutions in America. So he figured they had the spare money to pull it off, right? <laughs> So um, they, I believe, went to the provost who also happened to be in charge of the um, CS department, and they convinced him that an OSPO set up in the, in the research library was a good point, a, a good, good place for it at Johns Hopkins. And uh, at the same time, they started an Institute of Applied Open Source, which you know, the world doesn't need a ton of those, um, but they did that to help so they could step out of Johns Hopkins and help other organizations if Johns Hopkins wasn't willing to share. Um, so that was a hedge against the, the let's do, let's prune our own garden first impetus. Um, and then they started working together with some of the uh, organizations that they'd identified. So they had a project in mind already, which was to help out those community organizations. Because in addition to being um, in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins is also the largest private employer in Baltimore. And so it behooves them to, you know, help kids get education so that and, and have after school activities that aren't uh, going to lead them into gang violence and that kind of thing. So, um, so anyway, that's how that happened. Uh, they ended up getting a whole bunch of grannies in there too to learn how to use the computer from their grandchildren. So that's kind of cool. Um, I've seen that all over the world, by the way. Uh, we did a project when I was at Intel for China. Um, we did a set of of uh, computers that were localized in Cantonese because mostly it's Mandarin that is supported by companies like Microsoft. And uh, we had some theories about Linux on the desktop that we were that we were playing around with. Anyway, almost always grandma would call their grandchild that knew how to do computers. <laughs> it's pretty great. So I, I think that is 1230 and Kathy is gonna shoot me if I um, let people stay past. But thank you. Thank you. I'm getting lots of thanks on the chat. Um, thank you, Denise. Um, I sounds like you picked up another gig, another uh, <laughs> people want you. So uh, um, hopefully we'll hear a lot more from you. Thanks so much for um, joining us today. And thank you for everything you do in raising awareness and adoption.